Hello, welcome in. I'm Vanessa and today I am here to do my June wrap up. I actually read so much in June, which came as a surprise to me because I thought I didn't read anything because I spent the first two weeks reading this. It took me so long to read this. I thought, well, that's it for June. Here it is, right? But somehow the last two weeks of June, I guess I really pulled it together. So I guess I'll just start with this. Um, this is Wolf Hall and it is about Tudor history, King Henry VIII, which is a subject that I love so much, but obviously I have always kind of tended to focus on his wives. They're very interesting to me. I love the perspective of like women in this time period and kind of like the interpersonal dynamics and the power dynamics of these relationships with the king and everything. But this book didn't really focus on those things at all. This book is from the point of view of Thomas Cromwell, who was one of King Henry's like most prominent advisors during this time period. It's a lot more like business politicky than the kind of interpersonal politicky I'm used to reading about this time period with. It was really interesting. I really enjoyed reading this. However, like I said, it did take me forever because it is so dense. And it's also, I thought at times the writing style was extremely confusing. One of the things that I noticed that I was getting really frustrated by while I was reading it is that the author will go pages and pages and pages without naming a character and she'll just use pronouns. So it'll just be like, he went in the room, he said this, he looked at him, blah, blah, blah. And there were so many times when I was like, wait a minute, I think I've forgotten who is he that we're talking about in this scene. I would have to go back like four or five pages to see a character's name on the page, right? Which was just, I was starting to feel like I was just maybe very stupid, but then I went on Goodreads and a lot of people were saying the same exact thing. So I do think that that was an issue and it is why this book took me so long to like read and properly digest and absorb. And even now, I don't think that I fully understood what was going on a lot of the time in this book. But for the most part, I really, really enjoyed my reading experience. And I also feel like very personally attached. Like this book has a very close place in my heart because like I always say, I got this book from my favorite English teacher in my undergrad. She's a really special person to me and this book is really special to me. And then also while I was reading it, my cousin messaged me and told me like how much she also loves this book. So I don't know, some people that I really like like this book. And then the next thing I wanna talk about is the graphic novel Sweet Tooth. I read the first like 12 volumes. This semester I'm taking a class on eco-apocalypse and extinction narratives in North American media which of course Sweet Tooth is. This is about a pandemic that kind of collapses society and at the same time that the pandemic is happening, all of the babies start being born as human animal hybrids. People are very like hateful and resentful towards the hybrids. They're hunted by poachers. And our main character is a little boy who is part deer. I actually watched the TV show for this first and in the TV show, basically he was living in the woods with his father and then his father dies and he has to go venture out for himself. In the graphic novels, it's a little bit different. And I have to say, I didn't like the graphic novel <laughs> very much at all. Like, I really enjoyed the TV show, even though I think there definitely are some valid complaints about the show. It was a bit weird at times. But for me, the TV show had a sense of like whimsy and wonder and magic to it, which I really enjoyed. And then the graphic novel, it was just kind of gritty and brutal and harsh. And yeah, it didn't have a lot of charm to like balance that out. For me personally, it was not my thing. Another book that I read in June was Midnight on Beacon Street, which was so exciting for me. I loved this. <laughs> This is a thriller set in the 90s. The main character is a babysitter who is babysitting in a neighborhood where there have been a string of creepy break-ins into people's houses. And the story follows the events of one night that she is babysitting and some shit goes down. And also flashbacks to like when she was younger, when she was a kid who had her own babysitter, etc. And I loved this so much. Like as a 90s kid, the nostalgic 90s vibes were so on point for me. Even to the point that like the story itself, story Stories about babysitters were so big in the 90s. I actually had a short story collection called like Haunted Babysitters or something. And Babysitters Club too. I don't know why we were so obsessed with babysitters in the 90s, but like this, this is it. You know what I mean? I also loved the kind of meta aspects of this book in that it is somewhat 
a commentary on the horror genre in itself. It's very referential of other horror stories and like the slasher genre. And it also kind of explores the place in society that the horror genre has and why it's so important to so many people. And I also loved the emotional aspects of the characters and their development. The babysitter, Amy, the way that she felt so much like responsibility for the children that she babysits and like the weight of their care is on her shoulders without also acknowledging that she's also still a child herself. That's a very 90s kid feeling, I think. You know, we talk about this a lot with Gen X, but I think it's true for millennials as well, like being latchkey kids, always being just kind of left alone or just with other kids to look out for each other, which again, I think is just a part of that time period that this book captured really well. My only complaint with this book was the way that the chapters switched back and forth. I think it made the pacing a little bit weird because you're like waiting for something to happen, right? Like you start off the book, you know that something bad happens on this night while she's babysitting and you're like waiting for it to happen. And then you open the next chapter and it's a flashback. And then also within even the chapters that are from that night, a lot of them go back in time as well. So like one chapter will be 8 p.m. and then the next chapter will be 4 p.m. and you're just like, we're moving backwards. I wanna go, what's happening? A lot of the chapters were also repeats of like the same events of that night, just from a different character's point of view. But again, even this complaint really comes from a place of like, I wanted to know what was gonna happen. Like I was so immersed in this book. And yeah, I just loved it. Another thing that I read in June was The Queen of the Tearling, which has been on my shelf for so long. I'm happy to have finally read it. Um, this is a fantasy about a girl who is becoming the queen of her kingdom, the Tearling, after being like hidden away and raised in secret for so many years. And she doesn't really know anything about her mom and what kind of queen she was or like what's going on in the kingdom, which seems, okay. <laughs> I enjoyed this book. It was fun to read. The writing style was really nice. Even the story is like intriguing and the setting, it has such an interesting concept and I really enjoyed it, but I do have complaints that I just like, they almost take over my mind. First of all, a lot of things don't make sense. Like you have this heir to the throne that you're raising in secret so that she can become a queen, but yet you don't teach her anything about what is going on in the kingdom. Like nobody will tell her and it's very intentional that people are keeping these secrets from her and nobody wants to tell her. And I just didn't understand that because not only is it just like an incredibly stupid idea for the kingdom, but also like it affects you as the reader as well in that you don't know anything. But at the same time, I also feel like you don't really need to know anything that's going on, any of like the politics or the history of the kingdom, because at the end of the day, any of these like political fantasy questions about like, what's the right decision? What should the queen do in this situation? Blah, blah, blah. None of it actually matters because the ethics of this story, the morals of this story are so incredibly simplistic. A queen good, regent bad. Tearling good, other kingdom bad, right? Like that's really all there is to it. And it's to the point where like the bad guy is so cartoonishly evil. And it's not just just him. It's like every character that's supposed to be a bad guy is like, oh, they're participating in slavery. They're misogynistic and abusive towards women. They're also homophobic. He also has bad hygiene. And guess what else? His breath stinks, right? Like, it's just like, I almost feel like these issues that are being handled in such a heavy handed way are not actually being done justice because it's like the queen just shows up and is like, oh, you're doing something bad. I will behead you. Oh, our kingdom has an unethical practice. I will end it today. But again, like I said, I still liked the book. I still had a fun time reading the book. It's interesting and it's intriguing and I liked it and I had fun, but I'm going to need something more from the second book. You know what I mean? So mixed feelings, but mostly good feelings even though my negative feelings are more time consuming to talk about. I always feel like that's the problem with review videos is that like, even if the complaint is very small, it takes me so long to explain it that it feels like it was a huge complaint. And like, I hated the book and it's not, I just, it's a normal sized complaint that just took me a long time to talk about because I'm not good with my words. <laughs> Anyways, the next book that I read was Parable of the Sower. I also read this because I thought that we might be able to use it for our project, for our eco-apocalypse class. This is a young adult dystopian kind of post-apocalyptic story, which I thought was interesting because it's not like a total apocalypse. It's just kind of like society has gotten really, really bad. And our main character is a young black girl who lives in a gated community where her life is still 
a little bit normal. But like in general, the world, like poverty has gotten so bad and people have gotten so desperate that there is so much violence. And she knows that at some point, her community is not gonna be able to protect itself from that forever. And she kind of dreams of like someday going outside of her community and finding like-minded people who want to start a new community in a safer place, following the principles of this like religion that she's made up called Earthseed. We decided not to go with it for our project because it is a little bit simplistic in that, but I really enjoyed it. And actually it was a nice contrast to The Road by Cormac McCarthy, which we also read, which, you know, is one of the most popular apocalypse narratives, which is so like dark and cynical and pessimistic and like very individualistic. Whereas this was a lot more optimistic and hopeful and it is about forming community and like maintaining a respect for the humanity and the dignity of other people even in a world that is apocalyptic, right? So I did like this. And I'm excited to read other Octavia Butler books. She has a lot of speculative fiction that sounds really interesting to me. Another book that I read in June was After Sappho. Finally, my friend loaned this to me last year. It's told in a really interesting format. I'm not totally sure how to describe it, but it's about kind of the collective identity of a bunch of a bunch of the really influential female writers and creatives around the turn of the century so like virginia wolf and isadora duncan they were all kind of involved in this like artistic feminist movement and they were all discovering their freedom as women and the book kind of connects this to the legacy of like sappho and ancient greece and how all throughout time women like we're all doing this in whatever our respective society is right when i first started reading i wasn't sure if i was Gonna like it because there was like a mismatch going on for me in that the information itself was very dry biographical historical dates in fact this woman moved to london and on this date this woman met this other person at a party but then the writing itself is so flowery i didn't know what was going on i was like what i don't know it's like so unique and actually what really kind of made me like it a lot more was that in the back there is a biographic note which i think for me really drew the connection that i needed like for example it'll talk about like this quote and then in here a lot of it comes from actual literary works of the time period or like speeches that some of these women gave this is kind of like a glossary of all of those references uh, for example there's a line that says the modern world is perishing under a flood of ugliness. And that's actually from a book that one of these women actually wrote. So there's so many really cool parallels that I didn't notice because I'm not so familiar with most of these women's works. With the biographical note in mind, I think that this is such an interesting way to like make a beautiful emotional fiction out of real historical women and the time period that they were living in and the social and political movements of that time period. It was really interesting. Again, it took me a bit to get there and I'm still a little unsure about about it, but I think I really liked this. Finally, I would like to talk about some of the audiobooks that I listened to this month on Libro FM, the best audiobook platform ever, where your purchases support local and independent bookstores. If you're interested, there is a link down below, which helps me out as well. But I listened to The Paradise Problem by Christina Lauren. Listen, a Christina Lauren book never fails to like just pump me full of dopamine and serotonin. This follows a girl who has a fake marriage with some guy so that they can get into like low income housing while they're in college. And eventually she finds out that this guy she's fake married to is actually from like a billionaire family who he has a very bad relationship with. And he has been lying to them saying that he's actually married because it's part of the stipulation of his inheritance. And he's always kind of like found a way to avoid having to ever actually introduce his wife to his family. But now his sister's getting married and he has to go to the wedding on these beautiful tropic islands. And he has to bring someone that he can pass off as his wife. So it was good. I I mean, I have no complaints about like a romance about, you know, getting a free vacation to a tropical island and possibly um, marrying into wealth. <laughs> but, eh, you know, there wasn't necessarily anything like particularly compelling about the characters or their relationship. I think for the most part, it was just like a nice fun time. Another audiobook that I listened to was Stories I Told My Dead Lover, which was really good. This is a collection of short psychological horror stories. Some of them I liked more than others, but they were all bizarre and weird and dark in like the best way. And they had me like really captivated while I was playing Stardew Valley, like the most wholesome, positive, upbeat video game I'm playing and like listening to this terrifying, disturbing, disgusting audiobook. But it was 
really nice. I highly recommend it. Another audiobook I listened to was The Patriarchs, which is a nonfiction kind of dispelling the myths that we tell about the origins of patriarchy and how, you know, a lot of people think it's something that just kind of developed naturally from like, you know, the time we were cavemen. But this book really dispels that myth and shows through like science and history and anthropology and archeology span and everything that like this was not the case and that patriarchy was something that had to be intentionally created and also severely enforced because if it's not severely enforced, we gravitate away from it naturally. Like it's not our natural state as a society. And there are so many examples of other communities throughout history or in different cultures that have been matrilineal or matriarchal or simply like didn't have concepts of gender at all. And it goes into like why some cultures developed a patriarchy and others didn't and how it spread and kind of became the dominant thing in most places today. And it's really, really interesting. I really enjoyed this. And then the last thing I listened to was an audiobook copy of the Popol Vuh, which is a like an epic poem creation myth from Mayan culture. And it's actually one of the only ancient epic texts that we have that's indigenous to the Americas. And I had never really thought about this, but in all of my degrees, we've read a lot of epic poems from different cultures throughout history. But yeah, now that I think of it, none of them were ever from the Americas. It's really cool that we have this. And I think that it should be read more the same way we read like the Epic of Gilgamesh and Beowulf and stuff, right? Like it was really cool. I will say that this particular audiobook, it is read by the like professor or whoever that translated the text into English, which is very cool. And I'm very happy for him that he got to do that. And it's probably a big honor that he then got to narrate the audiobook. And again, I'm very happy for this man, but I don't know, may maybe we could have got a, like a professional narrator or something because like the man sounds like he is so bored of reading this, like he doesn't even want to be here. And I know that that's not the case. He must be excited about it, but there's just so many things got left in. Like you can hear him clearing his throat or like swallowing his spit. Or like he'll mispronounce a word and then start the sentence over and they would leave that in, which is like, Listen, I'm here filming this YouTube. It takes me hours because I'm saying the same sentence over and over and over again. I decide, oh, I don't like how I said that word. Let me record it 55 more times just to be safe, right? So I get that. <laughs> but like the editor, right? The editor should have been there. The editor should have had this man's back. You know what I mean? And it seems like no one did. So I wouldn't recommend this particular audiobook, but I do recommend the text itself. If you can find a written copy of it, it was really good and really interesting. <laughs> So yes, that is everything that I read in June. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it's not as long as it feels like it is to me right now, but please let me know what you have been reading or if you have any fun plans for the upcoming month. I would love to know. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed hanging out with me and I hope I get to talk to you soon. Bye.